All right. Welcome back to the dungeon. And uh, big surprise, got another uh, a book review or a book interview. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll put my two cents in there as, as it goes on. <laughs> but, you know, uh, but I like the book. I mean, but it, this is a book uh, from uh, writer-director John Penny. Uh, he's a he's award-winning writer and director. Uh, he's attended UCLA, where he studied film and received a degree in English. Uh, and now he also does screenplays, but he's also written short stories that have uh, won him awards from the Adelphi Academy in New York and uh, has been published in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Uh, he uh, also wrote uh, a thriller car called Hellgate, uh, that uh, movie starred William Hurt and Carrie Elways. Uh, so he, he, uh, his creations uh, have been uh, acted out by some quite notable names uh, in, in Hollywood. Uh, so, but, uh, and he's also uh, an adjunct instructor at Los Angeles Film School, been doing that since 2013, where he teaches writing and directing. So, uh, for all those people at uh, Los Angeles Film School, uh, pay attention because you are learning from one of the, uh, the 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 best people out there that actually you know doesn't just talk about doing it. He's actually done it, and uh, and he also has a connection with uh, uh, writing. Uh, I guess one of the uh, sequels to Reanimator. So I, I know that's uh, one of the things that uh, a lot of my viewers and listeners would uh, latch on to because we love we love re we love us, us some reanimator and uh god if, if i liked this if i looked as good as barbara crampton when i turned 60 uh i'll be happy you know i was just so but anyway we have <laughs> we have john penny uh penny right okay yeah john penny just like the coin okay yeah but uh same same idea <laughs> So, uh, well, that's a nice introduction. Thank you for that. Oh. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. This is great to be able to get you know some some word out on the new book, um, and uh, happy to talk about anything. Really, pretty pretty open. So whatever great. you want, and great. jump into it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, let, let's just uh, talk about uh, just your your uh, your history in uh, uh, screenwriting and uh, writing books and uh, films. Uh, and just, uh, how, how did you, one of, one of the, the, the things that I always, a lot of people are interested in is, is how do you get in, how do you get started or how, how do you get involved sure. with that? You know, so yeah, yeah how, what, what's, uh, what's your history or story in, in the, in the biz? Yeah, it's, it's, it's asked a lot and, um, it's funny because I always find that, um, based on the, I used to ask that same question of other people. And I would always get the, the way they did it. And that doesn't always apply to you. Right. So, you know, for what it's worth, um, I um, uh, came from a, a family of writers. Uh, my mother, Raylan Moore, um, was married to Ward Moore, who was a science fiction writer in the 50s, along with Ray Bradbury. And Ray was sort of a family friend. And uh, he had written introduction to my mother's book. Um, and, uh, when I was first interested, I went down to UCLA and she said, well, I'll, I'll write Ray. And, and this is in the era before email. And he says, will you take my son out and give him some advice on how to get started? So, uh, same thing. So I went to lunch with him and he was in Beverly Hills. He was very proud to have me order the uh, Ray Bradbury sandwich on the menu, which they had <laughs> named after him. With a, it was a little place called The Daisy, and it was pretty pretty well-loved in Beverly Hills for years. Anyway, so Ray uh, said, you know, what do you want to do? And Bill, what, what are your interests? And I said, well, I, I guess, because at that time, the way into film was you'd write a script, and, you know, hopefully somebody would pick it up. And uh -huh. I said, well, I, I guess I want to I wanna write. Uh, and, and he says, well, if you want to be a writer, don't write movies. Um, you know, write short stories and novels because there's nothing between you and the audience, which completely makes sense, obviously. And he went on to tell me, you know, forget the screenwriting thing, just focus on novels and short stories. So it really kind of messed with my head. 
And I went away scratching my head going, shoot, but I really want to write movies. It's, I guess I'm not really, I don't want to be a writer, writer. I want to write movies. It was very specific mm. for me. And um, so I kind of ignored his advice. And I, I continued to write <laughs> screenplays over and over and over. Um, and I got involved with some group of, of friends out of UCLA. And uh, we did a couple of movies, but we just sort of did them on our own. One of them is called The Power, The Dorm, The Drip Blood. Um, and finally, um, this movie called The Kindred with Rod Steiger, Kim Hunter, um, came along. And I, it was my first screenplay credit. It was a, a shared screenplay credit with some, uh, you know, some pretty interesting people. Um, and um, the idea there was that I, I had a very unusual hybrid credit on that because the way I had stayed employed uh, to pay the rent was to be working as an editor. So I really started in the editing room as an assistant mm. editor. And that put me in direct touch with producers and directors and people making movies. Uh, so by the time I did The Kindred, they said, well, yeah, you get a screenplay credit, but you're also going to be an editor on it. So it was a strange hybrid and it taught me more about screenwriting than anything i've ever done prior uh because you know being responsible for the mess on the page and then seeing it in the editing room you have to look at you say well what happened to that idea i had and then you, you realize well it's not it didn't make it through the the matrix because it wasn't something you could see or hear it was a it was a nuance or a an idea that you can't do in film right you've got to just write what you see and hear um, so it really made my screenwriting come together, the editing background. Huh. The editor, you're, you're, you're putting the story together for the last time in the editing room. Um, and so that really shaped my ability to, to write screenplays in a big way. Um, also, I got to work with the wonderful Joe Stefano on The Kindred, who, of course, wrote Psycho. Um, that was one of those life-changing moments where you grew up, uh, you know, admiring somebody like that. And then you're actually get to work with him and he's in the editing room with you and you're hanging out. And he, he was just such a really wonderful man. One of the many people that I, you know, been fortunate enough to work with through the years are people that were, were idols of mine or people I really admired. Um, anyway, so I sort of started through the editing room. After I wrote The Kindred, I, um, I stopped editing. And my screenwriting career began because once you have a produced screenplay, it was a national release and, and uh, you know, all that. So uh, I then went on a, the journey of just writing screenplays. And um, I went into the studio system. Uh, and, you know, a lot of your listeners may know the term development hell uh, from other people where they you know, they buy a script of yours. I was lucky enough to sell a script to Warner Brothers and they, you know, pay you really well. So it's like this gilded cage, but they never make your movie. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, and so you get, you know, into this thing where you're writing, you're writing screenplay after screenplay after screenplay, but they never actually become movies. And so that was a little bit frustrating for me. Um, and so along the, the way, I got a call because they were going to be doing a sequel to Return of the Living Dead. I got a call from my agent. And I said, well, I was I was an assistant editor on the first one, the original with Dan O'Bannon directing. Um, and uh, I sort of, we, we, we were editing where we were shooting. And I got to know a lot of the people there. And uh, subsequently, I've been included in a lot of the documentaries and, and books that have been written about it um, as being the sort of extended family of the Return of the Living Dead group, which is great. And they're all really nice people in that group um anyway so i went in and uh pitched the idea for return to living dead free to brian usna and the studio brass uh at trimark and um and they liked it they liked my take it was sort of romeo and juliet um sid and nancy uh, meets the living dead and that mythology that uh dan o'bannon had created for return to the living dead was so striking in that it was really sort of uh, pushing the zombie genre where I hadn't seen it before, and particularly the half corpse with that spoke back and they were talking to it. 
<laughs> and and Jimmy Karen slowly getting, you know, his legs cramping and turning into a zombie. And I said, wow, you've never heard that story so much from the zombie. Um, and so I came up with the idea to have uh, Julie be slowly decaying and turning into a zombie and, and Kurt trying to hold her on, hold on to her. And this love, tragic mm. love story. Um, anyway, so I, I wrote that and um, very proud of that movie. Brian and I hit it off. We've been great friends ever since, family friends. Our kids know each other. I mean, it's we've just been sort of woven together since then, uh, off and on. He went off to Spain for a while and did movies with the Fantastic Factory. But I, uh, And then our paths uh, met up again. Anyway, during, during that, after Return 3, I got offered every single uh, sequel to horror movies, like Leprechaun 2 and this and that. And, <laughs> and I said, oh, this is my one chance. I want to push out on my own. And so I, I turned down a bunch of stuff and, you know, went out with a spec script and the spec scripts were pretty big. And I sold this spec script to Avi Lerner, you know, of um, Expendables fame. I mean, he's produced a million movies, New Image. Um, and uh, that sort of got me on the path during the 90s where I was writing and producing, writing and producing movie after movie after movie. And it was great fun. It was a great run. Uh, Contaminated Man, The Enemy, That's Perfect. Uh, a lot of really fun movies to work on, and I loved doing it. Um, and during one of these um, shoots, we were shooting at a studio in downtown L.A., and somebody said, hey, John, Ray Bradbury's uh, shooting on the stage next to us. Uh, it was the ice cream suit. I forget the name of the, the full name of the script, and uh, Stuart Gordon was directing it. And um, so I went down, and I said, hey, Ray, how are you? And he proceeded to tell me the same old stories about my stepfather and all this stuff. And then I said, you know, Ray, here I am. He says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm producing and writing these days, features. And and I said, you know, 10 years ago, because it was almost 10 years. To, it, it was 10 years. And I go, uh, you know, I had this lunch and you were so grateful. And you gave me all this advice. But damn, I, I, I couldn't stay away from movies. And uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I just started. I, I didn't listen to you exactly. And I just started writing scripts and he looked at me and he says yeah john it's the most relevant art form now isn't it and it was like boom mm. i wish i had heard that <laughs> 10, 10 years, years ago, ago. <laughs> but you know and so at that point i realized it's not about i could tell somebody okay go start working in the editing room and then get to know producers and directors and then segue into writing you write something and show them that you can write that worked for me but you know everyone else especially today with with technology the way it is, um, you can um, you can make movies with with a very little uh, uh, in you know uh, budget, uh, and that may be a better way to express yourself. So I can only tell people how I did it. it was through the editing room. It totally honed my screenwriting craft, um, and and uh, and so I, I was doing great. Uh, finally, I, I did a couple movies where I felt, oh shoot, I could have directed that better. Um, I'd never directed anything. And um, I got sent out on a, a pitch where somebody wanted to hear my take on an idea. And I didn't respond to that take too much. But uh, I had my, he said, well, I really want to do something with you. Do you have any ideas? And I pitched an idea. And uh, he said, oh, that sounds good. Let's do that. And I pulled the old, OK, but I have to direct it. <laughs> and there was a moment there where, you know, it seemed like an eternity. But of course, I'm sure it was a matter of seconds. He goes, OK, you can direct it. So that was how I got my first directing gig. And I got into that. And um, that's been an interesting part of my career. Directing is very difficult. It's a, a big challenge. As you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the, I've worked with some really good people, uh, Catherine Heigl and um, William Hurt and Carrie Elwes. And I've been able to really have that benefit of, of, of those incredible, talented actors really helped bring my stories to life. And I loved it. Um, I'm still directing a bit. Um, as I've moved into my career, Brian and I uh, opened a company called uh, a partnership called Dark Arts Entertainment. And uh, what we do is we now are like producers representative for smaller genre movies and people looking to, uh, you know, move their movie into meaningful distribution and and really, you know, try to 
to promote and to nurture through uh, genre movies that we find interesting. Um, the first one was Reborn with Barbara Crampton, and um, uh, that movie was a dark arts movie. Um, we've done since then H.P. Lovecraft's Witch House, which is out there. Um, we have a couple new ones uh, in the pipeline now coming up, one called Terror Firma, which is a real yeah. fun one. Uh, and uh, another one um, uh, coming up called uh, uh, Snuff Queens, which is a an interesting, pretty, pretty, pretty tough movie to watch, but it's mm. a, it's a, it's a really interesting movie. Um, so we're and we're nurturing newer movies as well. We get them sometimes in the script stage, and we bring them through, <clears throat> like I say, through production and and stay with them and and help um, uh, guide them and mentor them. Um, yeah, so still writing, still working. Uh, I'm directing a series of, of uh, streaming shorts right now for a company, which is a lot of fun. And um, some of the stuff I've written lately, uh, the one was a sequel to Reanimator called Reanimator Unbound. And if your readers uh, are familiar with a book called, um, it's a really good book they should get called Untold Horror. It's a coffee table book, and you've got okay. uh, Romero, Landis, Dante, Yuzna. We all talked about the movies that we wrote or projects that we had that didn't actually get made yet. Okay. <laughs> some of them are in process. Some of them are, but we have a whole reanimator section in here on the on the script that oh, I wrote wow. with Brian, uh, with the artwork and everything. So it is it is an official sequel. It hasn't been made yet, but. Um, but I'm really hopeful at some point. It's a little expensive, which is what's been slowing slowing it down. But uh, yeah, and continuing on uh, with um, projects and uh, and uh, you know mentoring and uh, bringing new movies to the screen. So it's been fun, executive producing and things as well. Cool. Yeah. Wow. So uh, how did you find the time to write <laughs> write books? That's a really, you know, it's fun. I, I again, you you heard my little story with Ray, and I was like, oh, I don't want to be a novelist. I don't. Want, it's so boring, you know. I'm not interested in people sitting around. It's you know the family of people that I was around. It was just quiet people typing on typewriters. I said, oh, I want to be out on a set making movies. And, but um, it, ironically, what happened was I did um, I did uh, Hellgate, the William Hurt movie in Thailand, and then. I, over there, I reconnected with Brian, which was funny. Um, and I helped him on a movie uh, called uh, Amphibious 3D. Uh, at the time, I think it's just called Amphibious now. I uh, did some writing on that. Um, and then we reconnected, and I came back to L.A., and we sort of washed ashore here. And uh, I put went about you know, working toward putting together some projects that I want to direct. Uh, and one of the things that I was... Was, was playing with at the time was a, a really good script called Truck Stop. And um, my good friend, Steve Carpenter, who created the television show Grimm, um, Stephen Carpenter, he um, called me up one day and said, hey, you know, John, have you heard of this ebook thing? And I go, yeah, I don't know much about it. And he says, well, you can put your own work right up there and people will buy it. And I go, really? And he had really big success i'm going wow that's crazy i mean this is for real and he said yeah and he made an, an obscene amount of money on this ebook and i'm going okay okay listen i've got this script i'm gonna you know i'm gonna make it a novel so i took truck stop and i reimagined it as a novel and i went at that time it was sort of just getting started there in in the ebook world on amazon and so i put truck stuff out there and at the time the little trick that steve and i used was to, you know you could do your string of search words to find your stuff and we put um stephen king it just happens to be you know it'd be like a stephen king novel uh -huh. well this book of uh, truck stop just went really well on e on ebooks um did really really well uh, it was a number one ghost horror, number one horror book. At a, at, when it came out, it was just really great in the ebook world. Um, subsequently, 
uh, Amazon said, no, you can't use Stephen King's name in your search words. <laughs> That's cheating. <laughs> uh, didn't, didn't use it on my follow-up novel, Killing Time. But I, I really had so much fun uh, writing Truck Stop. I just really loved the novelization of it and learned the freedom that I was able to have and the all these thoughts that I had about the character, about the story, about the world that you wouldn't do in a film. Right? I was coming from a, a medium that was very specific in, in its form. And in the novel, I was able to really bring the depth and the the ideas behind the characters and the motivations and all that to life in a much uh, more three-dimensional way. And I just had a blast writing it. So I immediately did a follow-up novel called Killing Time. Um, uh, that uh, That's where I was told I can't use Stephen King <laughs> in, my, <laughs> in my search strings. Uh, the movie did, th- that book did about half the, 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 the sales that Truck Stop did. That's okay. And then I got really busy uh, doing a bunch of other stuff, uh, producing movies, writing new projects. uh, And I sort of drifted away for about eight years from writing novels. Um, And then along came um, Sean and uh, Mark at the time, Mark A. Miller, who used to run um, the uh, uh, Clive Barker uh, publishing world. Uh, left that and then started his own publishing company called Encyclopocalypse Publications. And um, he says, John, you know those books you have? Is he, he's told, are you interested in it? I said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And I signed up with them and they took over the running of stuff. Uh, and we had a lot of fun and they put out the paperbacks and they did the audio books and all that stuff. And just the greatest two guys to work with ever. Uh, so nice. So they're so smart and with it and they know what they're doing and um, are big fans, are big genre fans. And you can't get a better combination. Um, mm-hmm. So I, you know, we, we did the audio book and so forth for Killing Time and things were, you know, I had started um, It Comes Back uh, after I had done Killing Time. I got about, you know, halfway through, maybe not even halfway, maybe a quarter of the way through. And um, I kind of set it aside because I was getting busy. And I said, you know, I do have this um, novel I am working on because both Sean and Mark were looking. They said, hey, when are you going to do another novel? And I had time. Um, and um, so I jumped back in and, and uh, had a great time again uh, writing this, this thing and, and really enjoyed the, the process of writing a novel. Um, and so I, I got it finished. and. Um, now we're, we're putting it out, which is very exciting for me. I, I really enjoy it. I'm, I'm proud of this one. That's so, cool. um, yeah. Yes, yeah, so we're, uh, we're going to get in the book uh, pretty soon. But I, 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 I do have one more question about uh, uh, just how you approach writing. Uh, and then we'll get into it. It comes back. Um, now, when, when you have like an idea, it's like, okay, this... Uh, I, I got this idea, or even just a morsel of an idea, and you, you kind of, what, uh, how do you go about deciding, okay, this is going to be a screenplay, or this is going to be a novel? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. My default are screenplays. My, I write and see movies in my head. Um, and uh, so they're always movies first. And okay. that's just, because I, and then what happens is, um, like I say, I get involved in that process and I always develop them, novel or screenplay. I develop them as if I would be writing a script. That's how I know. That's my process. Okay. So I'll have a premise, right? I'll have a premise for something and uh, then I start fleshing it out and I, I sort of do like a, a beginning, middle, and end breakdown. Like in film, it would be act one, act two, act three. Uh, and I start fleshing out the bare bones plot points, and then I put it aside, and I'll go work on something else, and then I'll drag it back out, and I'll say, "Oh, this is not working," and I'll rearrange things and fix it, and put it away again, and come back to it. And eventually, the the bare bones 
plot points get more and more fleshed out with detail and character. Next thing you know, it starts evolving into an outline or what in film would be called a treatment or, you know, a, yeah, an outline or a treatment for a film. And, and, and it becomes like the short story version of a novel or screenplay. It would be that document. Um, and I keep expanding it and expanding it. So then I'll give that to somebody to look at. Um, as a screenwriter, I'm not afraid of feedback. You can't be, <laughs> you know, you're, yeah, that's that comes with the with the gig, right? So I'm very open in terms of I have a good group of writer friends that will always read something for me and say, "Oh, John, you know, you you, you missed this or that." And I always find it's much easier to to get my story squared away, uh, the, the the story mechanics in place, if you will, um, on that level of a short shorter story version. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like I can immediately throw out the middle if it didn't work and replace it in like a couple of weeks rather than labor for months and months and months. And the only to figure out, Oh shoot, I don't have this the story mechanics in place uh, in the second act or whatever that means. Right. Um, and so I feel very confident by the time I actually start the full blown writing process because I've got my little roadmap with me. Okay. And that's all stuff that I learned from screenwriting. Um, you know, when you're, that's just the nature of the beast, you know, oftentimes I'll have to, I'll have to turn in a treatment for, to the studio or the uh, producers just before I can start writing the script. So I'm very comfortable doing that. And, um, I wasn't always like that, but, uh, Brian Usna was the one who sort of told me, you know, don't be so guarded with your stuff. We're all, we're all here to help make a good thing. Come on. Just, I was very reluctant to turn my treatments of uh, Return to Living Dead 3 in because I wanted, I, I didn't think people would understand unless I did the whole thing. And he says, no, 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 no. Sure enough, we turned in the first couple treatments and uh, we got some notes back and then we kind of sort of listened to the ones that made sense to us and then kept moving. Pretty soon, we were turning in uh, treatment after treatment after treatment and getting no notes back. Huh. And he says, oh, well, they just they just don't they, now they they see they're too busy doing other stuff. I just they want to make sure that you're not, you know, building a wall between you and them and you're not open creatively. And it worked out great. And so ever since then, I've never had a, an issue uh, with sharing a treatment. Um, I think I've gotten better at writing them, too. So that helps, okay. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, that all comes full circle to the first things I ever did with my mother. Uh, Raylan was um, these these short stories that we wrote, and I was 16 years old when when I was published uh, uh, in fantasy and science fiction magazine, wow. um, which was kind of crazy. Um, and, but it said, "Hey, this kind of stuff is possible to do," you know. Um, and I think that helps as a, as a young person to be able to see, oh, you can actually write something, have it meaningfully distributed to a magazine like that, which is a pretty respected magazine in its time. I, I not, is it still around? I'm, I'm asking a really bad question. A magazine of fantasy and science fiction. But anyway, at the time it was one of those, yeah. you know, I'd go up to uh Forey Ackerman's house and he would have my copy of my uh, <laughs> magazine. I'd always pull it up and say, see, look, here's my the first short story I ever wrote. Um, but yeah, so having done that, I think also came full circle, right? Treatments are like the short story version of the of the movie or the or the novel. Okay, and um, and then it becomes like a, a fruit tree. You get so much fruit on the vines of that treatment; it's just ready to fall off. And then writing it is so much fun. It's just this beautiful. And if you get stuck, you have a little roadmap to get back on track if you need to. Mm. And you just relax and the characters start talking and sometimes they do things you didn't expect them to do. And when you're writing a novel, I can go down this this corridor and around this corner and, and talk all about this wonderful detail in their past that somehow is shaping them now. And mm. um, It's just a lot of fun. I've, I've really fell in love with it, uh, especially lately. It's been great. That's, that's cool. Is that what you were asking? I'm not even, I, I lost the question. <laughs> I keep bringing it back to the novels, but that's basically my writing yeah. 
this. Okay. Yeah, I was asking about, you know, how, how do you decide what what's a movie and what's what's a screenplay or what's a a book? Um, well, I, again, I'm yeah. I'm all about it, they're all movies in my head. Yeah. And, and I, I, I understand I, that. Yeah, go different. It's just the way you know, I put my 10,000 hours in <laughs> as a screenwriter, so it, it just sort of the way I look at the world uh, um, writing-wise, you know, with my, okay. with my writing work. Why did I bring you on here? Oh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> it's, you have a book coming out, or it's already out, right? It's, it's, uh, um, it, there are some advanced reader copies out there. Technically, the, uh, the day that it's coming out is May 19th. May 19th, okay. And uh, it's uh, going to be um, everywhere, according to Encyclopocalypse Publications. It will be everywhere book, books are sold. Cool. All right, and it's called so It Comes Back. Yeah. And uh, as I, I was reading, if, if, I mean, if this book had like a byline, uh, as I was reading, it was like, uh, it, what, what goes around comes around type of thing. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So um, now that I think really what was really cool, what really got me, I mean, it's, people talk about a hook. Mm. Uh, you got to hook your reader in. You got to hook your listener in or, or whatever. Um, and the one thing that, that just kind of really, the first, I'd say the first hell, uh, three four chapters uh, maybe uh just uh what propelled me and compelled me to to keep on reading and you know oh, I'm going to put it down and and go do something else uh but I had to keep reading because in the beginning you you're introduced to what seemingly is a lot of unrelated people and situations and you know it gets to the point where it's like what the hell is this Game of Thrones? Jesus Christ! Um, but you know, it's like, is anybody going to live in this thing? Uh, but it, it it does it it so it hooks you in. It's like, okay, what the hell is going on here? How are they? You know, the seemingly unrelated stuff. But as you go further, you stick with it. You find that these 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 sep seemingly separate things are very much related. And we finally we finally focus in and, and hook on to our main um, and I I, I I hesitate to call her a, a protagonist because you know she's she's not a goody two shoes but she's a cop so she you know you know she's not goody two shoes but our, our main uh, character Bianca yeah. and she's a police officer she's been uh, she's doing. She'd be put on a supervisor duty at uh, I guess the the, the midnight shift <laughs> at a police station, and uh, just all these other things that are going on, and the uh, the people that she works with, uh, they they bring in a uh, they uh, particularly on this particular night, uh, uh, they bring in a uh, person just been arrested, and she doesn't know this person from Adam. She doesn't. But he claims he knows her. Yeah, he's been, and he's she been looking and, for her. And he's he's like, uh, look, uh, if you if you gotta take me to this precinct, you gotta if you're gonna arrest me, you should, it's just, because I I uh, I need to talk to her, her yeah. specifically. So that starts the the road down to unraveling this whole thriller mystery with this. Um, I don't know. Uh, would you call it the Grim Reaper? Would you call it it's karma? Like a, it's like a, certainly an evil but, presence. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a blackness, a, 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 a destructive um, darkness. Um, you know I, that that comes from the other side, if if you will. Um, I've always been interested in that. A lot of my other movies deal with that divide and things coming back from that in this case i don't want to spoil anything it could be invited it could not be invited uh part of the discovery is why and how this is happening as you mentioned uh we do we do get some of those answers which is fun uh, but yeah it's um 
it's interesting. I just as a little bit of background, I did have a house in Yucca Valley uh, for many years, uh, a, a weekend house, and so I always was fascinated with that part of California, the desert, the, um, the strength, you know, the the uh, Joshua Tree mm. National Park, all that stuff. So I was sort of writing from uh, 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 that world I kind of knew, um, and. Uh, you know, I, I thematically a lot. I mean, it's it's funny. I don't like to think of myself as as working on on similar themes from piece to piece to piece. But um, if you look at Return of the Living Dead three and you see what's going on there about it's really hard to let go of somebody you love, uh, you're going to see repercussions of that theme in it comes back as well. Um, which it's, I never realized I was, you know, I don't think about, oh, I'm going to be, this is going to be the theme of my stuff, <laughs> but you seem to go back to those kinds of ideas, um, for whatever reason, at least I did. Um, and I don't do it consciously at all. I just start moving and these things sort of bubble up. Uh, but yeah, the, all, all what you said is, is true. And, and, um, the hope here is that, um, yeah, Bianca is is the, is is really the center of things, along with um, uh, the other guy, Cutter, um, and um, you know that's that's sort of the the heart of the movie. Are the it is, is trying to get it into that personal horror, um, uh, you know. And and one of the things I always love to say because I've always found it to be true um, in. In the past, a lot of times, horror, when it comes and, and really terrifying things happen in the, on a bright, sunny afternoon and not in a dark house or a dark police station at midnight. So a lot of the stuff I was able to play with, especially in, the, in this novel, is to move off into these different horror stories, almost, of the different characters, you know, anxiety, their, 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 their behaviors and their just really kind of horror but done during the day you know uh -huh. with daylight I, I know it's hard to describe maybe i'm not being clear enough but it's that vibe that you don't have to always be in a dark stormy night to, right. to really expose something really horrific like in this case the the uh, antagonist you would be i guess you can say the the force that's propelling this this evil entity um, is is something that um, you know was was from Bianca's past and Cutter's past that um, sort of they share in common. So um, that's kind of I, I try not to tell too much of the book, but I think that hopefully gives a little more of an idea. Um, yeah, and also I, I like I say I being a screenwriter all these years I see things, so there's a lot of visual. Uh, you know, uh, kinds of uh, machinations, I guess you'd say, uh, that that the, the evil presence is able to, this dark presence is able to manifest itself um, uh, with, I hope, some interesting and unusual sort of images and ideas and things like that. that that's what I was going for. <laughs> yeah. And I think, uh, for uh, if I remember correctly, because it's, some old. I, I'm. I don't remember what I ate last night, but I I, I read the book last week, and uh, uh, if I remember correctly, the the uh, I guess the, uh, the the karma or the payback or what, whatever yeah. whatever this uh, entity was dishing out. Uh, I don't want to say like fit the crime, but you know it, it's. There was something, some element of what this thing did to to our our ensemble. It's, I mean, yeah. we focused on on Bianca and uh, um, and was it? Uh, I forget the prisoner's name. It was last Cutter. Cutter. Uh, but but this is like a, an ensemble book. You have other people going on. And you well, know, that, co. That, yeah, I think what you're getting at is is for me. Um, horror, just if you're worried about 
physically surviving. Now, I, some friends of ours just watched Texas Chainsaw, the original, again, uh, okay. horror, and it's great. You know, it's very visceral and it's great. But to me, horror is is when you've got some emotional component that looking inward is far more scary, in my yeah. humble opinion, than just surviving. Um, and in each case, this entity is able to find out exactly what you feel guilty about. Right. What transgressions you had in your life. Right. And it's able to feed on them and it destroys you. It, it uses it to destroy you, your own um, self guilt and all the, as you say, karma of what they did wrong and how they slighted this person or that or whatever they did comes back to crush them. And so for me, I'm all much more afraid of going inward <laughs> than yeah. going outward sometimes. Yeah. That's just me. I find, I find really looking inward and finding how terrifying you can, you, you can find so many <laughs> terrifying emotions and <laughs> just things that will just drive me nuts. And that to me is where I was going with the book really is about that. Yeah. Um, the transgressions, the the guilt that this um, entity can prey upon, and that's why you're vulnerable. And it'll find whatever that is in your life, and it'll take you there. And so the the horror for the characters are not is not just the physical threat, right? It's the emotional feeling of guilt and you know just devastation that that emotionally that they feel. That's the real horror. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think, what you were trying to sort of that you were talking about it. Right. It's not just a physical threat. Right. It's an emotional threat. <laughs> it's, it's real easy. Which is you what know. the whole idea for the movie was. Yeah, because it, it's real easy to, okay, uh, there's a monster there, you know, Jason or whatever. Okay. And yeah. it, it's real easy to view the characters in this cookie cutter thing of, I'm the hero. I'm the final girl. Or is that I'm going to kill you? But that's all ex, uh, extrinsic. If I had right. That. But when you right. start talking about intrinsic things, that's yeah. a part of a part of you. You know, you uh, short of a lobotomy, you're not going to get rid of that stuff. It's going to be yes. with you everywhere. And to to have something that could, you know, it's a, it's like the uh, it's like the monstering. Jeeper creepers, he could smell your fear, yeah. you know. You, he, uh, but this thing knows your past, he knows your history, he knows all the good stuff, there's all the bad stuff, and he knows exactly or it knows exactly what buttons to push, yeah, to to uh, the F you up, basically. <laughs> yeah, so, well, the, the, the this there is a there is a through line to this, there's a logic to it, uh huh. Uh, there is a the, the entity is seeking something very concrete, um, and some of the people are getting in his way, its way, I should say. So it's not just randomly out there. I mean, it, it's very focused on what it's trying to accomplish, and it needs to get to one or two people. And in order to do that, it's got to isolate and divide to conquer. Mm. And so that's the that's really what it's up to. So there's a there's a disturbing logic. It's just not randomly floating around right. killing people. It's got a motivation. It's got a direct uh, a goal in mind. And, of course, we get to that goal at the end of the book, um, and it all makes sense, hopefully. Uh, it all sort of, like you say, it kind of comes together, and you say, oh, I see. This, this is what this is about, really. Um, and, yeah, I think that that's... That was always the the hope was to to really say yeah horror is not you know physical it's mental I mean it's just like the horror of things that you just for me some of the the darkness um, things that most frightening to me are you know inward not mm -hmm. not outward things that you may not be happy about and that either you've done or that you've pain from your past or something that you're dealing with that is unresolved. Those are the kinds of things to me that are really dark and, and horrific. <laughs> right. You know, so there, that, 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 that I feel is a pretty decent, um, sort of overview of, of that, of what at least I was trying to, trying to do. So. 
I'm glad at least some of it came across. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, uh, do, do you uh, give a, uh, a passage or a section of the book that yeah, uh, well, well, you give us a little uh, morsel so of? So we, uh... Yeah, let's do it. This is, uh, I feel like, why not just jump in with chapter one, right? All right. Um, here we go. Chapter one. Allison Cutter's eyes snapped open. She looked over at the glowing red clock on her nightstand. It was 3.30. She lay for a moment on her side, giving her groggy mind a chance to focus. Why was she awake in the middle of the night? The room was still, deathly quiet. Allison rolled over the other way, stretching her arm out for her husband. Ray? The bed was empty. Nothing but rumpled covers. Allison took another moment to focus, then slowly sat up. She swept her dark hair from her eyes. Ray? Baby? There was no answer. Allison's expression darkened. Where did he go? She slowly untangled her long, slender legs from the sheets and dropped her feet to the Berber carpet. She sat for a moment on the edge of the bed, scanning her shadowy, contemporary California bedroom. Everything was in place. Allison coughed to shake off a dry tickle in her throat and looked across the dark room at a reflection in the dresser mirror. Effortlessly beautiful with a narrow nose and graceful, gracefully long chin, perfectly balanced dark eyebrows that framed her dark green eyes. There was also a sadness that seemed to permanently linger on her 34-year-old face. It was sadness that had settled deep within her seven years ago and had never left. Why was she awake? Allison slowly rose, tugged on her oversized T-shirt and padded slowly to the door. She paused again, taking in the moment. Something wasn't right. She reached out and pushed open the bedroom door. The hallway was dark, empty. Pale light streamed in from the kitchen at the far end. Allison took a silent step out the door, and then she heard voices, or something that sounded like voices. They were hushed low and murmured. One purred deeply like a grown man, but the other was higher, soft and shallow. First there was one, then the other. A conversation of some kind. But how could that be? It didn't make any sense. Allison stepped slowly down the dark hall. The family pictures that lined the walls emerged from the dark shadows as she passed them. Pictures of her life in happier times, her husband, their son, sunny backyard pictures. Stiff, button-down Sears portraits. Wedding pictures. They lingered now as taunting, cruel reminders of a life that had vanished seven years ago. But they remained defiantly. To take them down would admit the ultimate defeat. But Allison wasn't looking at them as she passed this time. She was looking straight at the faded blue bedroom door halfway down the hall, the door with a faded collage of stickers, Star Wars stickers, Harry Potter stickers, the door to a child's bedroom, Danny's Danny's room. The muffled, murmured voices swelled slightly louder as she grew closer to the door. Allison finally paused just outside. Her breath involuntarily halted so that she could listen intently. Yes, there, the voices again. They were definitely coming from inside. She leaned forward, straining to hear. The low murmured voice hummed once again. It sounded like Ray. Allison waited for the higher voice to respond again. A few seconds passed, then a few more. There was no high voice. Allison slowly exhaled. She stared for a moment at Danny's door. In the weeks and months after it had happened, she had gone into that room and cried herself to sleep on the narrow little bed. When she woke up again, she cried all over until she fell asleep once more. The pattern repeated itself throughout those first long and agonizing nights. Ray had always been the strong one. She called it strong, but really he was just as shell-shocked as she was. He had managed to wall himself off from it all, wall himself off from her. Allison thought the bedroom of of the pit was when they lost. Allison thought that the bottom of the pit was when they lost Danny, but it wasn't. The real bottom came when Ray moved out and they separated for those six months. The low ver- murmured voice rose again from inside the room. It was definitely Ray. He was inside. Was he inside mourning the way she had done? Allison suddenly felt for him. 
She leaned up close to the door and raised her voice. Ray? The murmured voice instantly stopped. And then there was silence again, the same deathly silence that she felt when she had awoken. A chill crept through Allison, causing an involuntary tremor. Surely he had just heard her. Why wasn't he answering? She forced her hand to rise from their side and slowly reached for the doorknob, her fingers stretched out toward the glossy brass orb. She felt the cool metal on her fingertips as she touched it. She hesitated again, waited. Still nothing, just silence. Her fingers slowly tightened on the knob, pressing into the slippery cold metal. She gave it a twist. Click. The knob hit the mechanism inside. She slowly twisted it the other direction. Click. Same thing. The door was locked. Allison stared at the door, not sure what to do. The moment stretched in time, and still there was nothing, just the deathly stillness and silence. Allison slowly withdrew her hand. And that's when there was something else. The sound of buzzing flies. It was a discord that didn't make any sense. Flies? Why would there be an intense rotting odor singed her nostrils? It was vile and deathly. Allison involuntarily choked and covered her nose and mouth. She jerked back away from the door. Her bare foot splashed into something on the floor. She looked down. In the dim, pale light that streamed from the kitchen, she saw rotting, lumpy blood that puddled out from under the door, cracking the door. Allison's racing mind tried to make sense of the jarring sensory overload. The odor burned down her throat and her eyes watered. She staggered back from the door. She felt a wave of nausea rise up from another involuntary spasm in her stomach. She gagged and stumbled further back, her bare feet slipping in the rotting slime. She slammed hard against the fall wall, far wall, then twisted and pushed herself back, away. The rising bile from her stomach caught in her throat, and she choked it back, gasping in more of the repulsive air. This time she couldn't stop it. She vomited. The bitter liquid splashed to the floor, just missing her bare feet. She forced herself further down the hallway, desperately trying to find fresh air. She reached the edge of the kitchen and hailed again. This time was better. She staggered to the island in the middle of the shadowy room and wiped the tears from her eyes. She spotted her cell phone on the counter and reached for it. As she was lifting it to her face, she saw an impossible sight. I That's stumbled chapter there. one. <laughs> just stumbled when you... Yeah. There. <laughs> you know something bad's going to happen when you just start to get attached to this person. It's like... Oh, no, come on. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. They talk about, um, I think, successful horror. No one can feel safe. Right. And the, 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 the American Horror Story fixed that. Um, to his genius, um, the guy who created that, my mind is escaping right now, but um, big, big TV producer, um, he realized that if you did it as an anthology, then none of the characters were safe because they didn't have to come back next year. Yeah. And I think that really made American Horror Story work. Uh, it was an extended horror movie where no one is safe. If you have a recurring characters, then, you know, oh, they'll be back. Nothing's really going to happen. Right, right. <laughs> you know, so it's about trying to keep people off on the edge of their seat, keep them off balance. <laughs> Uh, I'm reminded of uh, when uh, The Walking Dead was uh, in production. It seemed like, uh, especially when they started really, really killing off some of the, the, the front line characters, people were like, well, if, if, uh, uh, who the, see, see, I am old, God, I'm a brain fart, the guy who has the, the crossbow. Oh, is that the sheriff or no? No, not the sheriff. Uh, the, the 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 rugged guy that uh, he would uh, use, yeah he would use the crossbow, but okay. uh, it would be like you know if if you kill him we riot you know it's like mm. <laughs> it's just so or right. it, or in in Game well, of Thrones if uh, if uh, yeah if that short dude dies we riot because uh, it was like. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, it's uh, it's a it's a it's better not to have a safety net in horror. I yeah. think uh, you know you, you got to keep keep that threat alive and all that stuff makes it fun for yeah. me anyway. Yeah, we. Uh, it's funny you mentioned uh, Walking Dead. Frank Darabont was a production assistant on a movie I did as an editor, assistant editor, 
uh, and he and Chuck Russell were Chuck produced it. It's called Girls Just Want to Have Fun. It was a, a Sarah Jessica Parker movie and a Helen Hunt movie. And and uh, uh, Frank was always in the production office writing on his computer, writing his, his scripts. It was fun to see somebody from so far back and then see where they ended up. It's really fun. Mm. Like it happens. <laughs> <laughs> Well, John, thank you so much for uh, being with us today. Hope you uh, oh, enjoyed the time in the dungeon. Now, if, uh, thank you. Now, if, if, if people want to find out more about you and your uh, lengthy uh, filmography and what have you, and, and some other books that you've done, where where, where could they go? I'm on um, I'm on Instagram at John Penny Filmmaker, which is a word uh, a mouthful. Um, and then I'm also on Facebook and I do take people in. If you request a friendship, I'd love to have you. Um, you know, I'm kind of old school like that. I, you know, it, it, especially fans. I love to communicate with fans that way. Fans of the genre. Mm. Uh, it doesn't have to be a fan of mine, just people who love, love, uh, this kind of cinema, um, and, uh, and writing and novels and all that, that whole world. So yeah, Facebook, John Penny, you'll I'll pop right up or uh Instagram. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Thank That's you. Good. And uh so the book is It Comes Back. Uh so uh check it out. It hits your bookstores. And uh while you're waiting for that to happen, uh check out uh, some some of the movies uh that uh, that you've either written, directed or edited you know whatever. They are out. <laughs> they're out there <laughs> they're still alive i think uh lionsgate <laughs> owns them now <laughs> okay <laughs> they, kept, they kept engulfing and devouring all these companies until my, most of my movies are at lionsgate right now thank okay. you yeah. sweet great thanks all again right. i really appreciated this this is a lot of fun thank you we had fun to uh torturing you here in in, in the dungeon <laughs> so you're always welcome to come back Excellent. Thanks so much, Thomas. Thank you. Uh, well.